Hello everyone, I'm Jim Staley with Passion for Truth Ministries and I just want to take a couple of minutes out and share with you something that has changed my life forever over the last two decades and my family's life without a doubt. What is that? It's the feast days of the Lord. It's God's prophetic calendar as I like to call it. Every one of us have a calendar. We have a family calendar. Guys, you have a calendar. Wives have a calendar. Quite frankly, they trump all calendars, right? We've got the school calendar. There's all kinds of calendars that are out there. But what about God's? What is the dates on his calendar that are important to him? And do we even know what they are? And are we in sync with that calendar? When I was introduced to this calendar over two decades ago, it really impacted me. My first thought was, wait a minute, like uh, I already have a calendar. I have you know, keep Christmas and, and Easter and Valentine's Day and St. Patrick's Day and all these different days were on the calendar. And then I realized that that was not the calendar that God gave us in the Bible, but that was the calendar that man gave us over time. And quite frankly, through the Roman church in the early few hundreds after Christ uh, died and rose again. And so as I began to kind of relook at this calendar, it began to dawn on me that this calendar wasn't given to just Israel. This was given to anybody that called upon the name of the Lord. As a matter of fact, uh, most people, when they talk about Passover or the Feast of Tabernacles or Pentecost, they say, oh, those are Jewish holidays. Those are the holidays that belong to the Jews. But then you go back to the Bible and you discover that God says something completely different. Leviticus chapter 23, 1 says this. It says, these are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feast. Nowhere does it say that these are his people's feast. He says, these are the feast of Yahweh. These are my feast. These are my holidays. These are my anniversaries, my wedding rehearsals that I give you that are connected to the first and second comings of Christ. And so that's what I want to actually propose to you is to show you that we have been defrauded as Christians for almost 2000 years since God's prophetic calendar was put aside for the new Gentile Roman calendar to come into place. And really, quite frankly, it, it happened out of anti-Semitism. They didn't want to appear to be like the Jews who were uh, and the early Christians who were Jewish that were keeping God's prophetic calendar. So a new calendar system was introduced slowly over time. But the reality of the calendar is that it's split into two completely different feast days. The feast days in the spring, there's four of those, and those all relate to the first coming of Christ. And the second uh, feast day set, which is the fall feast days, and those all relate to the second coming of Christ. If we had have known, if I would have known for the last 30 years of my life, I'm almost 50 years old now, but being a believer for over 25 years of my life, if I would have known that all of these prophetic calendar feast days were all about Jesus, I would have been looking into them all along. And so let's just go through each and every one of them and show you the power of these feast days and what we've been missing and the richness that they hold for us and the curriculum that God built into them to teach our families so that our children can grow up in the way that they should go and not depart when they get older. All right, so Passover is the very first one in the spring. Passover technically is not a day, but an evening. It's actually a meal. This is the Last Supper in the Gospels where Jesus Christ, he sat down with his disciples. He had a Passover Seder meal. That is the, the moment, the night before he passes away, he has a Passover Seder meal. And then the next day, he becomes the Passover sacrifice on the day of preparation as the Judean uh, side of Israel was going to keep Passover on that night. And Christ was slaughtered at exactly the same time that the, they slaughtered the Passover lamb, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. They had to get him off the cross and put him into the tomb before the, the high Sabbath began that night. It wasn't a Friday. The high Sabbath was the first day of unleavened bread. Uh, and the, there was another Sabbath on the end of unleavened bread, on the seventh day of unleavened bread. And so Christ dies on Passover and becomes the Passover lamb. He's put into the grave, and then that began, when the sun went down, that began the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where he prophetically fulfills the Feast of Unleavened Bread because during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
every single person was taking out all of the leaven out of their houses, which represented sin. And every single year, their children would do this, and the father would help them find all the bread in representation of getting the sin out of your life, getting it out of your house. What a beautiful symbol that Yeshua, Jesus, when he was put in the grave, was destroying sin, and through belief in him, we were getting sin out of the house. That's what he did. That was his entire life's goal. Get the sin out of my father's house, right? And then on the third day when he rose from the dead, that Sunday morning, right before dawn, just so happened to be the Feast of First Fruits, a real biblical feast day that's on God's calendar, where the high priest was set to cut the barley sheaf and a representative of the first fruits of the barley, and he would at sunrise wave it before the Lord as a offering of first fruits asking the Lord for a great harvest in the fall. Look at the symbolism. It's absolutely astounding and incredible, and it's rich. Jesus is raising from the dead. He is cut from the grave as the first fruits, he says, of the resurrection. And then he's presenting himself before the Father, asking God for a great harvest in the fall. He's fulfilling Passover as the Passover lamb. He literally removed sin uh, from the house during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and he became the first fruits offering of the great harvest in the fall. But that's not the last one. 50 days later, we come to the feast of Shavuot. And by the way, that in Greek is called Pentecost. You might be more familiar with the Greek term Pentecost. This is when it was the wheat harvest. They would bring two loaves of bread and they would bring it before God. They're fully leavened, fully mature, and they would wave it before the Lord, thanking the Lord for the great wheat harvest and giving him the first fruits of maturity, representing the believer in Christ in the first coming, starting off as just unleavened bread and very immature and very brand new, and then growing throughout time into the maturity of the two loaves, which represents the two houses of Israel and the two witnesses in Revelation, and it represents uh, the body of Christ, and it represents the body of the church itself coming together before the Father. And so it's a beautiful symbolism because in the book of Acts, on this very day, this was the day that Jesus, Yeshua, told the disciples, tarry and wait for me. And it was on this day that the Holy Spirit was given. And it was on this day that the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit were given and power infused the ecclesia, the congregation of God. And this is when not only did the power enter, but the divine assistance was given for them to, to fulfill and walk out their calling. That's the spring feast days of the Lord, my friends. Those are all about the first coming of Christ. If you move towards the last three on God's calendar, we learn through that curriculum that this is all about the second coming of Christ. How do we know that? Because the first one in the fall happens to be Yom Teruah, what today is more popularly called Rosh Hashanah, but the real biblical term is Yom Teruah. And what does it mean? It means simply the blowing. And what's it talking about? It's talking about the blowing of the shofar, the blowing of the trumpet. This was the day that kings of Israel were coronated. Even if they were came into their kingdom uh, and became king earlier in the year, this is when they were technically and legally crowned as king of Israel. Are you kidding me? At the sound of the trumpet on, on Yom Teruah, that trumpet signified everybody bowed and that king of Israel was honored as king. In the same way, the scriptures say that at the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first and those that are still alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds and every knee will bow that Jesus Christ is Lord and at that sound of the trumpet, our king will be inaugurated as king of kings and lord of lords on this earth once again. From there, you have 10 days and then you have the most holiest feast day of the year. It's really a holy day and it's called Yom Kippur. You might have heard of it and it's an English term of the Day of Atonement. This is Judgment Day. It's connected to the Judgment Day in Revelation, but this was the day that once a year, the high priest of Israel would go into the Holy of Holies only one time a year and he would first sacrifice for his own sin, making sure there's no sin in his life, 
And then he would go in and he would sacrifice. He would put the blood on the Ark of the Covenant for ancient Israel to cover their sins. This was the day that the sins of Israel corporately were atoned for. And the symbolism is in unbelievable and very deep into our own lives as believers because the high priest Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, went into the Holy of Holies with his own blood and he put it on the Ark of the Covenant in the heavenly realm. And what did he do? But he forgave and atoned and redeemed us back into his family. Amen. And so by believing in what he did for us as high priest, we get to be forgiven because of the Day of Atonement. It's the ancient Day of Atonement that we symbolically just memorially remember each and every year. That day, we're not sacrificing animals, but we're in a wedding rehearsal remembering what he did and looking forward to the Day of Judgment and preparing our mind, will, and emotions and repenting of our sin leading up to that Day of Atonement each and every year and asking the Father to forgive us. Five days later is the most celebrated time of the year. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the time period. It's a seven-day feast where Jesus was actually born. This was the time when he was most likely born during the Feast of Tabernacles in a sukkah, a temporary dwelling place. This is connected to the Revelation Marriage Supper of the Lamb. So for seven, eight days, Lots of people, millions of people, in fact, all across the globe go out in tents or RVs, campers, in their temporary dwelling places, and they honor the festival of Sukkot by celebrating and worship and doing everything from having a worship services to messages to sitting around bonfires to reading their Bibles, reconnecting with their family, and living life in abundance during that week, recognizing that there will be a day in the future well, the Father will come get us, and He will not only retrieve His bride, but there will be a great wedding feast in the heavenly realms. So it's not about the legalism of celebrating these. It's the fact we get to. We get to teach our kids, and we don't have to say, oh, this is not this, and that's not really real, and Santa Claus isn't real, and this isn't real. Everything is real in the biblical feast days. They're all anniversaries, all connecting to the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ integrating those into our family, teaching the depth and the richness of where they came from, and remembering that we, according to the New Testament scriptures, we are part of the commonwealth of Israel. We're not separate from Israel. We are part of Israel. That's why Jeremiah 31, 31 says, I come to give you a new covenant, not like the ones that your father, your forefathers broke, but a new covenant with who? The house of Israel and the house of Judah. My friends, there's no house of Gentiles. If you're considered in the new covenant, you are part of Israel. And that's what Paul says when he says that you were once far off and alienated against Israel, but now through the blood of Christ, you've been brought near and made part of the commonwealth of Israel and you're part of the covenants of promise. We get to do these things. And if we would have been doing these things all along, and if our Roman forefathers had not put aside God's calendar and given us a new calendar, we would not only be keeping the calendar of God today, but I believe prophetically our Christian lives would be so much more richer, our divorce rates would be lower, our intimacy would be greater. Why? Because we would be doing Bible things in Bible ways. And the more that you seek to do the heart of the Father, like 1 John chapter 5 says, here is the love of God. Those who love God keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. They're not burdensome because they're so rich with prophetic symbolism and they connect us like an anniversary. It is not a burden for me to celebrate my wedding anniversary. It is a joy. It's also a commandment in my house <laughs> and probably your house too, but it is a joy and a great reward indeed. My friends, going all the way back, I want to leave you with one other thought. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. In that, it talks about how God separated uh, the sun, moon, and the stars, and he put them in the sky for signs and for seasons. Well, that word seasons is not summer, spring, winter, or fall, like it's suggested in the English. Quite frankly, it's the complete opposite. It's the season of the Lord. It is the feast day of the Lord. That word in Hebrew is not like it is in English. It is moedim. And the word moedim means appointed time. It's a feast day 
or a festival, you can look it up in the Strong's. It's completely connected to the holy convocations of the Lord from Leviticus chapter 23. From the very beginning, the reason why he put all those stars and the moon and the sun in the sky was partly so that we would know when to meet with him. These are the festivals. These are the feast days. These are the anniversaries and the set apart times that God gave us to connect with us in a deeper way. This was the beginning of his curriculum to teach our children so that we would recognize that Christ would come and that we would have the richness of seven feast days a year that we could connect on an intimate level. My friends, if you're a Christian, if you claim Christ, these are for you. God set them aside from the very beginning of time. Before man sinned and after man sinned, he just wants to meet with us on these special days. God has set aside this richness for you and your family, and I believe it'll change your life exactly like it changed mine. Thank you for taking the time to watch this short video on why we as believers should be celebrating the feast days of the Lord. I'm Jim Staley with Passion for Truth Ministries, and I'll see you in the next video. If this video blessed you, I encourage you to watch this video and this video as well. And make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and turn on those notifications. Check out our Instagram page at Jim Staley Official and visit our website at passionfortruth.com. In the meantime, I'm Jim Staley and I'll see you in the next video.